Now we're going to go ahead and take our Bibles and go to Luke 11, Luke chapter 11. Today we have a story from the Lord about a man who persisted in prayer. I've called him the midnight caller. Now, if we had been with the Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry and watched what he did when he healed the sick and, and listened to him preach and teach, I wonder what we would have asked him to do for us if we lived back in that day. Some would have asked him to give them the ability to do those same miracles and, and to heal people. But others would have asked to have the ability be given to them to preach and teach like Jesus did and draw thousands of people out to hear us. But on this occasion here in Luke 11, there was one disciple who came to the Lord after hearing Jesus pray. And he said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. There was just something about the prayer life of our Lord that left an impact upon his disciples. There was something about his relationship to the Heavenly Father, something about the way he would move away uh, from them at times to get along with the Father for a time of prayer. that just left an impression upon these men that they could never get away from. And so they wanted to teach them how to pray. When we study the prayers of Jesus, we find that many times he would pray all night long. We also see that he would pray on, on special occasions in his life. He would pray before uh, he was uh, baptized. He was praying uh, when he was transfigured that day before three of his disciples were told that in Scripture he spent all night long in prayer. And, uh, or excuse me, he was praying then. But then when he chose those 12 disciples, that's when he spent all night long in prayer. And here's the thing about all that. If Jesus, the perfect Son of God, who was God in human flesh, found it necessary to pray, how much more should you and I pray? And, uh, you know, here's the thing, too. Uh, people pray not as often as they should. Uh, I heard it illustrated this way at one time. I think it's a good way to illustrate it. When we're on an airplane, uh, before the flight takes off, that, that person usually comes up, that attendant, and he gives us instructions on how to find or how to get this oxygen mask out if, if there's an emergency. And how to put the thing on and all of that. And uh, so people today pray like that. They, they, they had, their prayer life is kind of like that. They look at that as an oxygen mask. You know, you know, if you have a problem, you got an emergency, something goes wrong, that's when you better get that thing on and start to pray. And, uh, but prayer, folks, is not a spiritual oxygen mask. Prayer is, is really oxygen, period. We really need it. To, to continue on for the Lord, it, it's really like uh, breath for our spiritual life. It's oxygen for our soul. Jesus said in Luke 18, and verse 1, one, men are always to pray and not to faint. And the thing about that, that verse right there, what our Lord was saying is, hey, we're going to faint spiritually if we fail to pray. We cannot get along uh, without prayer. We can't make it. Uh, we can't survive really spiritually if we fail to pray, and uh, we're going to faint if we don't pray. And, and so we need to understand how important it is. We can't even make it through the problems we face in life unless we learn how to get a hold of God in prayer. Martin Luther once said this, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. I think he ended that down pretty good. Prayer is more than a privilege. It is a necessary part of our walk with the Lord. Now, I've read surveys before. They've all told us that, uh, at least what people say, the majority of the people in America pray. At least they say they do. So that would mean young people pray, grown-ups pray. Uh, most people pray. But what Jesus tells us in this story is how to really go about praying. He shows us how we can pray in such a way that God in heaven hears us and answers our prayer. Now, this morning, by way of outliner, there are three things I'm going to show you from this text I want us to look at by way of outline. Number one is this, as this chapter opens up, Jesus provides a pattern, a pattern on how to pray correctly. Now, the Lord shows us how to pray. And the great lesson he gives us here is just exactly how we are to pray in a correct way. In verses two through four, we notice that there is an abbreviated version here of what we call the Lord's Prayer. Now, if you want to get the full thing, yet you want to go to Matthew 6, parallel account. But this one here is also called what we call the Lord's Prayer. I always have said it's better to entitle this the Model Prayer instead of what formal churches call it the Lord's Prayer. 
And why do I say that? Why do I make, what, do I make a deal about that? Because in this prayer, part of it is uh, we're praying, Lord, forgive us of our sin. Jesus never would have had to have prayed that. He was the sinless son of God. So I call this the model prayer. Now, it's okay to pray this in a group of people if, uh, in, if you meet it from your heart. And, but I don't think it's why Jesus gives us this pattern to pray as a group, like many formal churches do. Now, I understand where they get this, our Father, as it starts out. But here, the thing is, uh, there's more to it than just a formal uh, setting here. He is sharing with you and I the kinds of things that ought to be included in our daily prayer. Every one of these things, we're going to see these in just a moment, are things that you and I should be praying about every single day. And he shows us here how to pray in a correct fashion. Let's take a look at this. He starts out by saying, uh, well, let's, let's begin at the beginning, verse 1. It came to pass that as he was praying, Jesus, in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So the Lord does that, verse 2. He said unto them, when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Now, let's, I want us to look at several things here uh, that he's talking about. First of all, Jesus is saying here that prayer is simply talking to the heavenly Father. Right? Very simple. And it really... Uh, has to do with our relationship with him, our Father who art in heaven. That implies there's a family here involved and that we who are saved today have a heavenly Father. We are his child. So the real question for people today is, is God your heavenly Father? Can you correctly pray our Father? There are some people who believe this. They say and believe that God is the Father of everyone. This is what the Universalist Church believes it's out there. Uh, and uh, what they say is all you have to do is believe uh, in God and, and then we're all brothers and sisters and that God is the father of every human being. They call that the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man, and they're dead wrong. Now, that little thing right there, that little statement makes everybody feel warm and fuzzy. You know, hey, God's my father, everybody's father. But you know what? That's a falsehood. And they'll say, isn't it wonderful that God is everybody's father? Well, the problem is, no, he's not. <laughs> the Bible teaches that God is not the father of everyone. Now, God is the creator of everyone. He's the creator of all people, but he is not the father of all people. You and I have to be born into God's family. And that happens the moment we trust in Jesus as our personal savior. So once we're born again, that's when we're a child of God, and we can then correctly pray our Father who art in heaven. That makes prayer much more understandable, really, and a whole lot easier if you realize that you're just simply talking to your heavenly Father. I mean, it makes a difference if you look at prayer that way. I'm just talking to my Father. Now, my kids were small in our home. On occasion, they would come and up to me and ask me, you know, for certain things, and occasionally they would ask for some money uh, to go and buy some ice cream. Now, do you think that my kids would say, when they made those requests to me, O oh, thou ministerial reverent one, thou who dost stand in the pulpit and exegete messages from the Bible, uh, wouldst thou consider taking from thy wallet some of thy currency so that we might enter the store and receive some frozen cream? Do you think they asked me to talk like that to me? Absolutely no way. My kids would just go up to me and say, hey, Dad, how about a couple of bucks so we can go out and buy some ice cream? Pretty simple. And then, you know, when we look at prayer that way, as we're just simply talking to our Heavenly Father, it does change our whole spirit, our whole attitude about prayer. So the Lord starts this out telling us that we're going to pray that way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Notice here how he's using the personal pronoun, thy we see, first of all, that prayer is directed toward getting things that God is interested in having done on this earth. So we got to get that right away. Primarily prayer, folks. So many times people look at this in a selfish way, but prayer is primarily not us getting our will done in heaven. It is God getting his will done on this earth. Prayer is not us trying to talk God into doing what we want done. It is surrendering ourselves 
to do what God wants done. It's doing his will. A lot of people look at prayer as some kind of a arm wrestling match. You get in an arm wrestle with God and somehow if you twist his, his arm enough, God's going to give in and he's going to do whatever you want him to do. That is not pr- at all what prayer is. Perhaps the greatest prayer ever prayed was the one that Jesus offered in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified when he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. Now, he was talking, of course, about the cup. He was praying that that cup would pass from him, that, that cup entailed being separated from God the Father, his Father for the first time in eternity. And that was a hard one. That was a wrestle for Jesus. But he ended up saying, not my will, but thine be done. So prayer is talking to the Father about things that are important to him on this earth. And relationships are what is really vitally important to the Father. Then in verse 3, Jesus moves on to this matter of asking. Prayer is not just talking to the Father, but here is where we think about it often as prayer is also asking God for things that we need. Just simply asking God for things. And I want you to notice how the personal pronouns change here. We move from thy, praying to, to, for the Lord and his will, to we and us. Let's look at that. Look at verse 3. Here we go. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sin. For we also forgive everyone that's indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. One of the simplest and most understandable definitions of prayer is that prayer is simply asking. We're told in Philippians 4, verse 6, let your requests be made known unto God. When a child has a loving father, that child never hesitates to go to that dad and ask him for things that they need. You know, again, I remember my kids when they were at home, hey, dad, look at my my sneakers. They're worn out. I need a new pair. And that was like... If I got by one time a year, I was doing good. Usually it was twi- at least twice a year, new sneakers. My son wore those things out. Or a daughter may say she needs a, a new uh, dress or new article of clothing. And they don't hesitate and come to us and ask for those things. And the Bible tells us that we have a privilege as the, a child of God, of going to the throne of God that we sang about this morning and asking him for things that we need. And I want you to notice in this model prayer, what the Lord Jesus says we ought to be asking God for. And as I said, these are things we should be praying for every single day. That's why prayer is vital. It's, it's like oxygen for our soul. We need these things every day. Let's look at them. In verse 3, he says in verse 3 that we can ask God, starting off here, for physical needs. Okay? That's why he's saying, please give us this day our daily bread. Physical thing. Philippians 4.19 tells us that our God will supply all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What a great promise. God's going to take care of us, folks. He will supply all that we need. We never have to worry about the daily needs of our lives because the Bible says we're to, we can just simply pray about them and God will meet those needs. I'll tell you what, we're, we're, we're promised that he will meet all of our need. We're not promised that he'll meet all of our greed. You know, too many people are wanting too many things for themselves, and it's not really what God wants for them. But we can talk to the Lord about our physical needs. And listen, when God meets those needs of, that we have, we, we ought to, every time it happens, we ought to thank him for meeting that need. And not just the big things. I mean, the big things we do that. Oh, man, God, thank you so much for getting me through this and answering this request prayer. But even the small things. We ought to be thanking him. And when he does meet those needs, be thankful for it. Um, And just thank him for things he provides for us that are of a physical nature. Simplest thing I can think of, we ought to bow our heads every time before a meal and thank God for that meal, even when we're at a restaurant. And by the way, I haven't done this for a while, but you can do it on occasion. You can look around um, and see who does that at a restaurant, who's praying before their meal. It's almost a rarity anymore. People just sit down, order their food, and when it gets there, they just dig in, right? And uh, we've had, we all have unsaved relatives, most of us do. And that's what they tend to do unless we step in and say, wait a minute, let's pray. Let's thank God for this food. I read the story one time about an old farmer. He came to, the, to town one day. He was sitting in the restaurant. And when his meal was brought to his table, he just took up his hat and prayed. There were some smart-aleck teenagers 
sitting nearby. They weren't saved, and they saw him praying, and they thought it was a joke. They thought it was so funny. And so when he got done with his prayer, one of the boys spoke up. He said, hey, old man, does everybody do that where you came from? And the old farmer looked up at him, never missed a beat. He said, well, just about everybody except the hogs. <laughs> we ought to thank God for uh, our meals and for everything he meets, those daily provisions. We, we can ask him for those simple physical needs, and God's going to take care of it. And then the Bible tells us here in this text, we can ask God for our social needs. I'm talking about where we are getting along with other people. We, we, now, we're, we're told here we're to pray, forgive us our sins. And then watch this, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. So every one of us are prone to sin. All of us fail. And so every day of our lives, we have to go to our Heavenly Father and we have to ask him to forgive us of our sins. Not so that we can stay saved. We're going to be saved forever, eternally. You pray for forgiveness of your sins so you can have that wonderful fellowship with God that he wants us to have. So you pray and you confess sin uh, for that reason every day. And then we're told in the Word of God that all of us uh, are to forgive those who sin against us. It's talking about it here in this verse. And so here's the thing about it. Here, here's why yeah, I, believe, I believe Jesus is bringing these two things together. We pray for forgiveness, then we, then we forgive other people. He's bringing these together because of this fact uh, if we can ask the Father to forgive us, and for as much as we have sinned against him, then we ought to be able to forgive anybody who sinned against us. That's what he's saying here. We can ask about our physical needs. We can ask about our social needs, make sure we're right with other people. And then in the third place, he's saying here, we can also ask God about our spiritual needs. We are to pray Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And that really uh, literally reads from the Greek, deliver us from the evil one. And that we know is the devil. So we are to pray every single day that God would protect us in the spiritual realm. Now, all too often we think about the need for protection in the physical realm. And certainly we do. I mean, there, it's a dangerous world out there today with the increasing crime, the violence out there, uh, all the other wicked stuff that's there, the immorality that, that's there. And so we, we just live in a world where we have that kind of, a, of, of wickedness going on. But we also live in a world where there's a real live devil. And we can't see him or his demons, but they're at work in the invisible, unseen world. They're around. We just can't see them. And we're in a battle every day. So we need to pray for God's protection. Years ago, there was a guy, and, and he was called the Unabomber. And they try to chase this guy down. They, whenever they get serial killers, they always try to, they always attach some kind of a title, and that's what they gave the name for this guy. The guy, I forgot, his, it was a la weird last name. Ted was his first name, I know that. He had a degree from Harvard University. He was a PhD, he had a PhD from the University of Michigan. He served on the faculty of the University of California at Berkeley, a, a highly intelligent man, but he came to the opinion that all technology was evil. It's kind of like what that guy said to Paul that day, much learning has made you mad. Well, it didn't make Paul mad, but this guy it did. Much learning had made him crazy. And he came to some really faulty conclusions and so what he did, he decided, okay, all technology is evil. So he decided he was going to blow up all these people he knew about that were involved in technology. He would deliver them a package, and, and they would open it up, and it would blow up in their face. Now, what the Unabomber was in the physical realm, the devil is in the spiritual realm. Satan and his demons are involved in daily delivering to people spiritual bombs that could blow us up and wreck and ruin our life and testimony for Christ. We don't need to wait now, folks, for that, that bomb to get here. We don't need to wait for the temptation to arrive. And then if we mess up, pray for God to forgive us. What he's saying here is we need to pray before the temptation ever comes. That's what he's saying. We're to pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. And that way you don't even have to pray for forgiveness because you don't commit the sin. You've, you've already prayed for that protection. I think too many Christians are like that teenager. He's driving his dad's car, and he was going too fast one day, and he ran off the road. He hit a tree and, and messed up, tore up the whole front of the car. 
and he's sitting there with his head bowed down on the steering wheel, and, he's, and, he's, he's, and suddenly he starts to pray. He says, oh, God, please, I pray this accident may not have ever happened. Sorry, it did happen, right? You got to live with the consequences now. And that's just it. I mean, a lot of Christians pray after they've gotten into a mess. Well, how about praying before you ever have to get into a mess? And so we need to do that. Pray before the temptation ever arrives. So that's what the Lord does here. He starts out this chapter. He provides a pattern on how his people are to pray correctly. We need to pray. And what he's saying in all of this, we need to pray about today's needs, pray about yesterday's failures, and then we need to pray about tomorrow's danger. Isn't that amazing how he does? He, he hits all three of those areas. All right, then our Lord went on, and uh, what we see next here is that he paints a picture. Here's the second main point. Jesus paints a picture on how we can pray persistently. And here's where this beautiful story comes in that he gives. And, and this picture he's painting is really uh, oriental in nature. By that, I mean it was, it was, a, it was a customary thing back in this day. There's, this is an interesting story. And in many ways, there it was funny. I mean, the Lord had a sense of humor. I believe Jesus went around with a smile on his face. He had the oil of gladness above his fellows, the Bible says about Jesus. So it's, you know, I believe he had a smile. It's never wrong for Christians to smile and to laugh and to enjoy life. And uh, I mean, I feel sorry for Christians who have no joy, it seems. I, you know, I, I mean, I feel sorry for believers who can't ever seem to smile and they look like they've been weaned on dill pickle juice you, when you look at them. Doesn't need to be that way. I have a feeling that our Lord had a little chuckle as he was telling this story. I want you to notice again the picture that he paints. Here's this man, and it's midnight. His friend had passed through town, had, been, had knocked on his door. Now, if you had a guest or a visitor that came to your home back in those days, it was considered uh, Eastern hospitality for you to receive that person into your home and provide them with something, if it was at night, to provide them a place to sleep and to give them something to eat. And so a friend came passing by at midnight, and the Bible tells us that this man did not have any bread to set before him. So you've got a real embarrassing situation on your hands here. There was no convenience stores back then, no 7-Elevens or all-night grocery stores back then. So he did the only thing he could do. He went over to a neighbor's house. Again, it's midnight. He starts calling out to his neighbor, Hey, wake up, Ben. Joseph has come past the through. I don't have anything to give him to eat. Please give me some bread that I can set before him. Again, in those days, uh, things were a little bit different. They all, the families back then had houses that had just two rooms. They call them the lower room and the upper room. Okay. And the family lived in the upper room. Up there you had mom, dad, and the kids. They were all up there. And, uh, and usually the animals were kept in the lower room down there in the lower level. But in this case, it's late. The man of the house is agitated. He says, hey, man, don't you know what time of day? It's midnight. I have all my kids up here. We're all in bed. They're asleep. He said, uh, you know, if you don't keep quiet, uh, you're going to wake them all up and disturb them. Now get out of here. Go away. That doesn't do it. This man is now yelling. And now he goes over there and he's banging on the door. Look, I have to have some food. I got a friend. Did you hear what I said? Help me out here. And Jesus says, after a while, the guy get, he gets out of bed, not because this guy out down there yelling out there was his friend, but because of this man's importunity. And that word importunity means persistence. He just stayed at it. He just kept on yelling, saying, hey, you've got to help me, man. I've got a serious problem here. I've got to have some food for this, this guest. So the man of the house finally says, man, I am going to have to get up. If I don't, this guy's not just going to wake up my family. He's going to wake up the whole neighborhood. So he goes down there, and, and uh, he goes to the front door with some bread, and he says to the guy, all right, here you go. Now get out. Get, get going. He says the midnight caller on his way. Now, I want us to get to the bottom line here. I'm sure we've all heard this parable before. We've heard this story before. So what is the message that Jesus is trying to teach us about prayer here? Yeah, we've got to get that down. When you think about it, there is a problem here. And so people have sometimes have misinterpreted this thing. Is Jesus saying that God is like that sleepy-headed man of the house? Is he telling us here 
that the Father will fuss us out if we come to him in prayer. Is our Lord teaching that we have to harass God persistently over and over again to get him to answer our prayers? Some people think that about this story, but that's not the case. I would say no to every one of those things. What Jesus is doing here is he's teaching by way of contrast. Okay, get the context. He's not saying God is like that sleepy-headed neighbor. In fact, we are told in Psalm 121, verse 4, he that keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is never asleep. He can't be. He's God. He's always awake, 24-7. Now, that's good news for us. There are times when we're hit with bad news in the middle of the night. Okay? And, and I mean, that's when you need to talk to God. And can you do it? Of course you can. He's always there uh, on duty. He will never fuss at you when you come to him in prayer. We are told that in James 1 and verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally, and he upbraideth not. That word upbraideth means he doesn't scold us when we come to him and ask him for things. So that's it. God does not fuss at us for often coming to him in prayer. No. The thing, thing is, God wants us to come in to him in prayer at all times and ask for what we need. He loves to hear that from us. So Jesus is not saying in this story, that we have to be loud and yell at God and twist his arm to get him to answer. No, he's not saying they have to beg for a long time in order to get God to answer your prayer. No. God is, Jesus is simply saying here, if a sleepy-headed neighbor is moved by persistence, how much more is our loving Heavenly Father going to be moved when we keep on praying? That's the point of this story here. And so there's the, here's another question, though. Why does God teach us the persistent prayer? I mean, why doesn't he just answer our prayer immediately the moment we pray it? Well, we get some answers here. Look, in, look next, if you will. Let's jump up here to verse 9. Jesus said in verse 9, And I say unto you, this is right after he gives this story about the midnight caller, I say to you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So again, is God trying to give us a hard time when we have to keep on praying and seeking and knocking on that door? Is he trying to ha hassle us? No. I will say this. Sometimes the reason God wants to, us to persist in prayer, to keep on praying about something, is because he wants uh, to do something in our hearts and lives in a special way. And so we, he wants us to continue on uh, and, and keep on praying. And sometimes, you know what, we're not even ready for an answer to prayer. And so God has to do a work in our heart to get us ready for that answer to prayer. And uh, so here we're told this, persist. We're told to ask, to seek, and to knock. And what we see here is intensity. We're told to hold on to God in prayer, to persist in that prayer, and never give up. That's been a problem for Christians all through the years. They have a serious need, and they'll... They'll pray, and, and they'll ask God for something one time. They'll, they'll pray a second time, maybe a third time. And when God does not answer that prayer, they just give up. They let go, and they quit praying. But the Bible tells us here we're to be persistent in our prayers. I heard a story one time about a duck. Then not a true story, obviously. A duck, this duck came waddling into a department store one day. He said to the clerk, you got any duck food? The clerk said, I, he said, no, we don't have any duck food. Get out of here, you dumb duck. The next day, the duck came back. You got any duck food? And the clerk said, I told you, you dumb duck, that we don't have any duck food. And if you come back in here, while I'm back in here and, and doing this again, I'm going to nail your web defeat to the floor. The next day, that duck came waddling back in again. He asked the clerk, you got any nails? The clerk said, no. The duck said, you got any duck food? <laughs> now that, folks, is persistence right there. That's staying at it. What are you praying for? That's the question. What are you seeking from God? Now, again, you go to the original Greek, and in verse 10, it gives, out, it gives the tenses here. And so what the what Lord's saying here is if you keep on asking, you'll receive. If you keep on seeking, you're going to find. If you keep on knocking on that door, it'll be opened unto you. So Jesus provides a pattern to teach us to pray correctly. 
He paints a picture to teach us to pray persistently. And then last, one last thing I want to notice here in closing, he presents a promise. There's the third thing. He presents a promise so we can pray expectantly. All right, our Lord presents a beautiful promise here. It's a promise, really, that, that our Heavenly Father is much more dependable in this matter of answering our prayer requests or any kind of request than an earthly father. Look now in your Bible at verse 11. He says here, But son, ask bread of any of you that it's a father. Will he give him a stone? Um, the answer, of course, is no. I mean, it, well, you know, then he goes on to say, uh, will he, uh, if he asks for a fish, will he give him, for a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Okay, so uh, there you go. If he asks for a fish, are you going to give him a snake? Of course not. If he asks for an egg, is that egg going to give him a scorpion? No way. And look what he says next in verse number 13. If ye then being evil. Let me stop right there. What he's talking about right there is, okay, there are some unsaved men who love their kids. They want to do what's best for them. And so the Lord's saying here, okay, if that's the way it is with an earthly father, how much more, look at it here, if an, if an evil parent knows how to give good gifts to their children, how much more should your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now, there are times when we ask God for something that is bad for us. It's a bad request. And God, of course, is not going to answer that. He's going he's to wait until he's going to give us the best, what's best for us. And we have a heavenly father, it says here, who gives the Holy Spirit to those that ask him. Now, here's the thing, and some have misunderstood this too. The fact of the matter is, we who are saved already have, right, the Holy Spirit. He's living inside us. So he's already there. So what is Jesus saying here then? I believe in the context. You got to get the whole context. He's telling us there is no need we have to where there's not some ministry of the Holy Spirit to provide that need for us. He's living in us. He's going to provide. For example, I gave you one verse earlier, James 1, 5. There are times we, we need wisdom. We need God's wisdom to make a decision, it's a major decision. We want his will. And so what do you do? Well, you need to, you need to look to the Lord uh, and yield to the Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is that spirit of wisdom. There are times we have difficult problems and, and uh, maybe a difficult case of somebody that, that needs to get saved. And, and we're going to need power from God to deal with that. So how do you get that? Jesus told us that the Holy Spirit will give us power to meet that need. So we, we, we do uh, need the Lord uh, many, many times to the Holy Spirit to help us with things in our life that we have needs for. And I, I want to say this too. When it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, we need him more than anything that we could ever need. I love what the Bible says in Romans 8, 32. We are told there, if God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him, that is with Jesus, also freely give us all things? What that great verse is saying is when you get Jesus, you get it all. And you have it all. Okay, I mean, you, you, that is, it's an amazing truth right there. Let me, let me wrap this up by giving you an illustration. I've told this story before. It does, it's a, it's, it does bear repeating. The story, it's a true story. It's told of a very wealthy man. He was back when the Romans were still in power in this world, way back there in the early days of, of, uh, of the first century. And, and uh, so there was this wealthy Roman man, the days of those, that Roman culture. He had a, a faithful slave, a servant. He named Marcellus and and then he had a very wicked and profligate son. Finally, the father couldn't take anymore what was going on. So he called in his son. He was getting near the end of his old life. He called in his son. He called in his servant, Marcellus. He said to his son, you have been a terrible son to me. You're not worthy of my inheritance. You're not worthy of any of my riches. So I made a decision. I am going to give everything I own to my slave, Marcellus. Actually, he said, uh, almost everything. I'm going to give you one gift of all that I own, but that's all you can have, and I'm going to let you make the choice. And just like that, as quick as a flash, the son said, okay, then I'll take Marcellus. 
You see, folks, when he got Marcellus, he got it all. The greatest decision we ever made in our entire life is that we came to Jesus, took him as our personal Savior. When we trusted Jesus as our Savior, we got all the good things that God wants us to have. Every blessing, every need, every answer to prayer is found in our personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. When we put Christ as our Savior, we got the Holy Spirit. We got everything we need. If there's anyone here today or anyone at the sound of my voice that needs Christ as your Savior, we would urge you to come to him without delay. Trust him as your Savior. He'll meet all of your needs. For those of us who know the Lord, may we learn these lessons on prayer that we see in this text. May we keep on praying. May we keep on faithfully serving the Lord, living for him, and do it for his honor. Let's bow our heads together for closing prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful passage of Scripture. Lord, we thank you so much for our Savior, for the Lord Jesus, the, the example, the, the perfect model that he is, the example that he set. And I pray today, Lord, you will teach us to pray like Jesus prayed. Pray correctly, to pray with persistence, Lord, and to pray uh, with, ex with expectation that, God, you can meet every last one of our needs. You can meet the needs of those around us if they'll just turn to your son. So, Lord, take the message today. Use it to speak to us and challenge us afresh and anew to be sure that we stay on our knees in prayer. We can't survive without it. It's like spiritual oxygen to our soul. Thank you for these truths in Christ's name. Amen.